Okie dokie. Um, my name is Paul Cripps. Uh, I'm a, an independent um, spatial technologies um, geomatics uh, type of guy. Uh, and I'm currently undertaking doctoral research at the University of South Wales on uh, geosemantic technologies. So more on that in a moment. Um, what I've tried to do here is sort of take some of the things that I'm working with in my, my research uh, and try and apply them to this sort of this domain, this uh, historic environment thing, and try and come up with some ideas for discussion. So um, please take it in the spirit to which uh, it's intended. So we'll have a look at sort of some background where I'm coming from, some of the resources that we've got, some of the problems that we have with, with spatial data, some of the potential that some of these uh, new technologies uh, and approaches offer, uh, and then some ideas for some, some strategy and some issues with, with moving forward with, with such a strategy. So background. Um, my research project is called G-Style, which is Geosemantic Technologies for Archaeological Resources. So it's working within sort of two subject areas, uh, the semantic web link data side of things and also the, the geospatial side of things. And it's the, the fusion of these two, these two areas. All of the sort of link data stuff um, that, that Kerry was talking about is now sort of extending into the geospatial uh, arena. So all of everything that Kerry said plus uh, geometries and places and all that kind of stuff. Um, and to do this, there's uh, emerging ontologies uh, for, for dealing with um, the specifics. Kerry mentioned SCOS. There's a, a similar kind of thing called GeoSparkle, which is emerging as a standard, or well, it is a standard. Um, uh, and that's, that's the kind of thing that I'm working with. So it's very much what Kerry said, but, but spatial. Just as a, a sort of flavor, uh, one of the case studies that I'm looking at is... Um, how we can sort of link data between archaeological excavation uh, records as they move up into the inventories and across into the museum. So a lot of the time, the links between these, these data objects uh, get broken for, for one reason or another, but we can use the spatial components to, to try and uh, link this stuff back together. So that's uh, just a, a, an idea. Um, so when I'm talking about the spatial entities, what am I talking about? Um, Largely, the, the vector objects, points, lines, polygons that we're dealing with in our information systems are, are typically database environments, increasingly sort of linked data environments. In the historic environment, we have a very, very broad range of, of stuff. Um, I'm going to whiz through this bit very quickly because I want to get on to the, the potential bits. But as you can see, a whole range of, of data types, types, types of, of, of information. Um, and metadata, information about the information. This is an example of some of the sort of rich spatial data that gets produced by uh, contracting units. The kind of project GIS that is used for the interpretation and analysis of sites. And we've got um, identified archaeological features, interventions, um, post-ex um, uh, finds data, attached to these, these things. We have multimedia attached, so we have uh, images of, of hand-drawn plans, <coughs> section drawings, all that kind of stuff. So a very rich digital resource, which acts as the source for a sort of historic environment record in, in many ways. Um, another example, uh, this is the Stonehenge Navy World Heritage Site US, which is a management tool maintained by English Heritage for managing the World Heritage Site. And one of the key bits in this is the uh, HER data. So they extract data from the HER, put it into a separate system to do uh, management type stuff with. Moving forward a bit, this is a, an example of some, some of this geospatial link data. So what you see here is the kind of graph that Kerry was describing. Uh, and importantly, if we get down to the bottom here, this whole section of the graph down there is all Ordnance Survey open linked data. Um, so we're referring to the concept such as North Lincolnshire as a county. Um, so this is starting to get the geospatial into the, the world of the link data. So what resources have we got out there as um, historic environment sector? We have local resources. We have the HERs, many of whom are using GIS. Um, and they work in many and varied different ways. We also have national resources. So we have AMI, the Archaeological Inventory Maintained by English Heritage. We have the Nat National Heritage List for England, which is the, the statutory stuff, scheduling, 
listing, all that kind of thing, which also has a legal element to it, um, and comparable resources in Scotland and Wales. I'm sorry, I'm going to focus largely on, on England today. Um, with a, I'll come back to Scotland again at the end. And on top of that, we have a whole plethora of other resources uh, out there. So uh, resources in, in planning authorities, national parks often maintain their own information systems. There's, there's HERs out in commercial companies and heritage trusts. We have a whole range of infrastructures such as Heritage Gateway and Oasis. The National Trust maintain an HER. Um, the churches folk are currently implementing their own system for managing churches. DEFRA have data that we use. Portable Antiquity Scheme. On top of all this, we have subject-specific resources, such as project archives, uh, specific databases on specific themes. We have things like the AIP, which draws things together and, and is another separate resource. And then we have all the publications, the grey literature, museum collections, and a whole bunch of digital archives residing in places like contracting units. So, basically what I'm saying is we've got a lot of data out there. Big problem with this is this data is, is managed in a very disparate way. So we have a lot of prob uh, a lot of duplication of data, not for any particular good reason. In many cases, um, it overlaps, it conflicts. We have issues concording where we have the same thing referred to in different resources. How do we reconcile that in order to do um, the work that that we do? Um, Maintaining this infrastructure is costly. Um, constantly exchanging, transferring, exporting, publishing, re-importing takes time. It drains resources. This is compounded by sort of formats and systems, interoperability. There's the perennial bugbear of non-digital data or digital data such as PDF, which isn't particularly what you'd call spatial data. All of this compounded together makes it difficult to use. Then we've got other things as well that chip in there, such as licensing, costs, paying for data. Um, spatial data as text. In a lot of these information resources, even GIS, things like county, parish, isn't treated as spatial data. It's treated as a text-based index on the data. And that takes time to maintain and, and uh, ensure that that's uh, up-to-date and current. Um, and the idea that once we've finished with our digital data, we put it in a pile, put it over there. It would be nice to actually have this data available for reuse so that we can layer stuff um, on top of it. And retention and disposal as well. When you start getting into the local authority realm, um, there are policies to do with retaining data, which data should be retained, which data should be disposed of, which when we're talking about the longevity of our shared cultural heritage knowledge can be problematic. So, here we have our little historic environment person down the bottom here, wanting to undertake some work, and these are the things he has to think about. He's got to acquire the data. He's then got to transfer the data. He might have to pay for the data. In many cases, he's got to digitise paper stuff that gets sent through the post. He's got to check that he's licensed to do what he wants to do with the data. He's then got to clean the data, make sure that um, all those inconsistent terms that Kerry was talking about are, are dealt with. If he's got data from three sources, he's got to stick it all together and work out, okay, I've got three monuments, are they the same monument? After all that, he can finally get on and do some heritage work. And this is just all of the different sort of resources that we've got available and the, the path that some of this data goes through. So, basically, what I'm suggesting is, it's a bit of a pickle. So, some possibilities. Um, these are some of the sort of things emerging from, from the research that I and, and others are doing, which um, may help with some of this. So one of the things with the graphs that Kerry was uh, showing is the idea of inferencing. If we know certain assertions about information are true, we can infer other pieces of information. So in the case here, um, we know that this particular monument is in a particular parish, county, we can infer if we know that that is the same as the other monument, we can therefore infer that the other record is in the same uh, place. Um, if we know that this, if we do some concordance work out, this monument is the same 
um, as this monument, and this monument is referred to by a particular archaeological activity which produced a report. We can then infer that that report also applies to the other monument record. Um, and the, the great thing with some of the um, spatial geosemantic stuff is it supports a broad range of spatial operators. So we can talk about intersecting. A lot of the tools that we use in our GIS, we can use within these inferencing uh, tools. So is it contained by, does it uh, intersect uh, these kinds of, of fairly fundamental spatial relationships? Right. Um, we can also use this to enhance and enrich existing resources. So uh, the colonization of Britain project that I showed you the quick slide of, I used the Open Refine platform uh, alongside the Ordnance Survey's Reconciliation API to turn the text strings that were the parishes and the counties into the URIs that Kerry was talking about. So we've gone from text string to concept there. So um, we can then shove this data back into our information systems. So we're enhancing, we're enriching them. We can use the spatial side of things to mediate our searches. So if, for example, we're searching for heritage assets in a particular parish, our information system can say, well, we've got these different parishes here. Which one do you want? We could, there's, there's data sets out there for referring to historic parishes. We could even include those. Which, which geometry, which boundary do you mean when you talk about this particular parish? Or you can have a user-defined one. So in other words, we can actually feed the geometries that we're drawing out of this um, information system to use the basis for the query, uh, which we can pass off to our, to our web services, and then request that data back in a format that suits the need of, of our client application, be that what it is. We can, this is interesting and up for discussion, national resources. Are they not simply an aggregation of the local resources? So we have our HERs with all their different depictions. This is the same monument. And we have our national record. Can we not see the, the overview, the national record, as, as simply an aggregation of the, the collective um, uh, local records? With, obviously, additional data. So if there is actually additional stuff to be recorded here, you can have that but you don't need to duplicate the work that's being done at this point. You can layer this stuff, you can link this stuff. So potential, we're talking about aligned resources using these persistent identifiers that, that Kerry talked about. Linking data, not exchanging, copying, transferring. Aggregation, not duplication. We can draw up and synthesize using um, these structured techniques, which allows us to focus our resources by sharing our efforts so each group of people within the historic environment sector can focus on maintaining the information that is pertinent to them and then it all comes together by using this uh, linking approach true spatial indices so we can we can talk about the um, actual polygons rather than the uh, the terms for the, the parishes and counties all this is dependent on standards and there are now Lots of standards out there, um, emerging and published, uh, for, for doing all of this. I would suggest that we build on the good bits of existing infrastructure. There's, there's some really good stuff out there. Oasis, for example, we can, we can do a lot more with that. The Heritage Gateway, open up the API, provide more, more access to, to things like that. But crucially, um, local maintenance. The people that know our cultural heritage data the best are the people closest to it. So I would suggest that it's the HER folk that should be the, the core of this, um, this um, view. So moving towards a strategy, um, we need to bear in mind who is, who is a stakeholder in this cultural environment um, thing that we're talking about, historic environment, sorry, uh, and focus on user needs, responsibilities, skills that, that came up earlier, funding, all of these things, but crucially, divide the labor, share the load, make it more efficient, and then we'll have more time to concentrate on things like content. Um, for those of you who like 80s children's TV, this is Voltron. This is how I see the, the historic environment sector functioning. We are each of these different things. We all do our, our own thing in our own way. 
and we come together like Voltron. Um, I was recently made aware of, of the Scottish experience, the shed. Um, crucially, um, they've done quite a lot of work on this. It's taken a number of years to get to this point. And they looked at a single definitive resource as opposed to sort of these distributed linked approaches. And they seem to have gone for the latter. So um, I'm not speaking in isolation. I think this is, this is a great uh, piece of work, and I give it a big green tick. So overall, this is just kind of a shelling out of how this sort of stuff could work. So we have inventory management systems, tools. We have data creators and maintainers working with these tools to maintain their own bit of our shared resources. Through standards-based interfaces, we can provide access. And this can be controlled access. I'll put this in in case there is a need for paywalls or secure access if, if the information is deemed as sensitive or whatever, to various clients to provide access. And importantly, we can use the linked data approaches to link out to these whole range of, of resources that are, that are out there on the web. Um, all these slides will be up on, on SlideShare later, so do have a look and um, comment. Big issue with implementing wrap up. Big issue with implementing such an infrastructure is where these resources reside. Um, so in many cases, the, they're within host organizations who may not be able to actually do some of this uh, for one reason or another. In the research community, a lot of these tools are free and open source software. Um, they are not commercial off the shelf tools, and that can be problematic for uh, particularly local government, where they may well have policies which restrict the deployment of, of such um, systems. So there are thorny issues here to be resolved, many of which are, are political and not necessarily technological. Um, but the key here is um, compliance and, and standards. Oh, the government procurement bit. Um, that's actually quite important. After the uh, lock-in that the, the uh, government have had with particularly Microsoft over the last decade, um, they're now moving away from specifying software and towards specifying open standards. And this is the kind of move that we can leverage to try and get some of these um, technologies uh, and, and tools out there. So, we need to make better use of our spatial data resources. Efficiency is the key word here, um, especially in these times of austerity. Not efficiency, as in making people redundant because we don't need them anymore, as in we can free them up to do more useful work through linking, sharing, and, and, and working together, leveraging technology infrastructure, improving our, our shared skill base, uh, and focusing on what users actually need. We can do this using standards. So we have the industry standards, web stuff, the geospatial stuff, the heritage standards. But the standards that we work with need to be collaborative, workable, and usable. And just to reinforce, standards. Um, so uh, there's my details. Um, all my research gets blogged on the, the G-Star uh, blog, um, there's my two research groups and the contact details are at the top, so do feel free to uh, get in touch. Thank you. <laughs>